Okay. Okay, guys. Shall we start? Okay. First of all, do we have any questions, any issues, any pending? Uh... No. Okay. So, uh, I have some news. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh... But uh, by the end of the lecture, there's going to be a, uh, the demonstrator also, and we're going to discuss uh, a little bit about the uh, labs. If there are any issues about the labs, although you should have told me when I ask you if there are any issues. Anyway, keep them uh, now until uh, the end of the um, lecture where we're going to discuss it. Um, after the end of this, um, of the two hours, and uh, after we finish uh, discussing about the labs for the uh, the uh, uh, data mining. There is also a feedback uh, session for the machine learning. Okay? Clear to everybody? Clear. So let's go and talk about data mining now and talk about missing data, outliers, and ensembles. Okay? Uh, this is what we discussed last time. We discussed about anomalies, we discussed about association rules. 
Do we have any questions about those? We said about when to apply anomal detection algorithms in comparison to supervised uh, learning algorithms. I would like you to remember that and know that. Okay? And if I give you some examples of one uh, of a problem that you will know which one of those uh, methodologies to apply. We talked about fitting a Gaussian and when the probability is less than a threshold then we uh, uh, detect, we can detect outliers. This is in the case of, uh, uh, we do the break in two dimensions, in uh, uh, each dimension separately. We said when fitting about multivariate Gaussian, important things to be remembered. We talked about mixture of Gaussians. I didn't give you any complex uh, formulas for doing that, but this is a general formula that describes the probability in the case that you model a distribution based on the mixture of uh, uh, components. Uh, and we discussed about association rules and uh, specific uh, algorithm, the a priori algorithm. And what we're going to talk uh, today is about uh, dealing with uh, missing data, the first thing, dealing with outliers, and then we're going to talk about ensembles. And let's get going, because time is precious. Um, and uh, um, talk about missing data. So what is missing data? Missing data is um, um, entries in, the, in our data matrix in which here the columns are the attributes, are the features, and the rows are the individual entries, the individual samples, and some of those values may be missing. Okay, it might for several reasons. It can be, uh, you can have something like a, not a number, you can have a, a, a minus one in the case that the positive number was supposed to be there. Uh, it is of course important to know why they may be missing and if you know that then you can um, uh, uh, take that into consideration, okay? And in the case that uh, you know that, in the case that uh, there is a missing value sometimes that fact by itself can have its significance, okay? So if somebody says uh, you're making now a survey and then somebody is uh, uh, declining to answer, that could be information by, by itself, okay? It might be something that it is uh, important. And of course it is, uh, and the, and it is significant to know uh, whether in the situation that you have in hand, whether the data will be missing during training time or during test time, whether you can expect that some of the data will be missing during test time or uh, uh, where you have a situation in which the training data set that you have is corrupted, okay? Uh, and that is quite important for, the dis for deciding which algorithms you're going to use to deal with a problem, okay? That's clear. Let's see, uh, we're going to see some examples now and you will see that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's say that we are building now a regressor in which we have, to, uh, we have several attributes and then we need to predict the price of a car, let's say, okay? What we have seen so far were algorithms in which we were assuming that we have, that the data that we have, the x's, okay? One, two, three, so those values were, um, uh, encoded in a vector that had fixed dimensions, okay? In the case that something is missing, then it can be a problem. So uh, you cannot, let's say that you have built a linear classifier uh, and uh, in which you have uh, this times something plus this times something plus this times something. And when I say this here, because you have a discrete, uh, discrete values, how would you encode the type of the card? What would you use? You cannot use a logistic regression here as is because the type of the type is a discrete uh, thing, right? You cannot multiply, say, saloon times zero point uh, something. Okay, what do you do? One, yes, one k encoding. Who agrees with that? Who disagrees with that? Nobody good. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you have you list all the number of uh, all the types, uh, and uh, you encode each type as a, a one out of uh, k encoding, which means that for each entry only one value will be one, and all the other ones are going to be zero. Okay. 
Uh, and therefore, you will not have only one vector, one, one weight for the type. You're going to have several uh, weights for uh, each specific type. Is that clear? OK. And the same thing with a make. But in any case, uh, so in some, some of those are maybe missing. And in that case, you would not know what to multiply with a specific uh, uh, make. Is that understandable? Uh, and there are ways a little bit around that. We're going to see some of them. OK? Good. Do you know how you can, um, uh, and it can be that both at training and at testing, do you have any ideas about how we can address that? Let's say that we have, uh, I don't know, either in training or in, or in testing, whatever you want. Just give me some wild ideas. Okay. Just drop it, okay, during training or during testing? Okay. Uh, okay, and this is one part of the, yeah, to drop them. That's a good answer, but let's see what the, are the problems with that. Uh, anything else? Taking me. Wait a second, wait a second. Thank you. Turn. Okay. Okay, so you can infer it from other data. And from which data will you will infer them? from similar ones based on the other attributes, on the remaining attributes, right? Okay, yeah, that's uh, a good answer. And that is the basis of one of the algorithms that we are going to see. Yes, who else? Yes? Taking, taking, mean. taking the mean? Yeah. Okay, did you look ahead there, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to be here. Uh, yes, so yes, so what, what you can do is that you can take the mean in the, uh, in the case of the doors, for example, and then come with 3.5 doors. But at, uh, uh, I'm joking now. In some cases, you can do that. In some cases, you cannot. We're going to see what are the problems. But as I have indicated now, you may end up with things that are a little bit strange. OK? OK? Anybody else? Take the mode, yes. So the mode, so the most uh, frequently occurring uh, value. Okay, you can take that as well. So basically, trying in this, in, the, in those uh, uh, three last answers, you were trying to substitute the value with something else, right? Okay, something something that made sense. All right, let's go on. You can find most of them. Um, um, I don't know what that shows, but uh, in any case, it's a good thing that uh, you come up with uh, ideas that have been uh, there before. So the one thing is to is the so-called this strategy is called denial and drop now things that are having missing values. Now you can do drop with in two ways. So you can either drop uh, data entries that uh, have missing values and then trying to train uh, uh, with the remaining ones. So it is good because it's, it's very simple. Um, the thing is that uh, if you have, if uh, uh, the missing values now, they, you, could, you could lose, of course, if, if you drop the uh, points that have missing values, then you can lose information. That's especially true in the case, as I say, that the missing values have some significance, right? So you can, uh, by the fact that you have a missing value, in the case of that I, I no, no reply, it can be an indication of, for example, political orientation of somebody or, uh, or whatever, okay? Uh, you have less data, which means that you are more prone to overfitting. And the other thing is that if you drop it in, uh, uh, if, you drop, if you drop a row, then it means that you cannot apply it during training time. So what do you do? Uh, sorry, you cannot apply it, yes, you cannot apply it during test. What is your strategy for deciding uh, uh, the class, for example, or uh, the outcome for a data entry for which some of the values are missing? Uh, and uh, in some cases, it may be that, uh, I don't know, if you, depending on the data set, it can be that you are left by that, you're uh, getting rid of a lot of information that might be very useful. In this case, only one row would be left. And imagine that this was, and there are several situations in which you might have a lot of missing values. Let's say that you are having a medical, uh, in the medical domain, and there are some tests here that are very expensive. 
and that can be applied or were applied only in the case that uh, the doctor says that uh, it is imperative to do them. Okay, in most of the cases you would have missing values for those. Okay, but the fact is that some other values here would be indicating that those tests were not necessary. If you adopt this strategy, you would get rid of them. That's something that is not very good to do. Okay. In any case, uh, uh, simple, dirty solution. Simple and dirty solutions sometimes uh, are good. Okay. Uh, you can drop, uh, and the variant of that is to drop the attributes. So drop attributes for which you do not have, uh, you have uh, 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 missing values. Again, with the same problems that uh, you had uh, uh, before. And combinations all of the, all also of those, but uh, again with the same issues. Okay. Uh, the other one is to treat the missing data now as a special category, okay. uh, which is again simple. Uh, it is useful if the missing data is uh, uh, significant, but it is valid. Or so of course it is, it is uh, when the missing value is uh, 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 uh. yes okay so it is more it is more useful if the missing value is significant if you put another category there that says that the missing that the, um, how do you say that that uh, uh, missing the value is significant it's good to replace it with a special category okay uh, it is though only valid for categorical uh, uh, attributes, so for example the make of the car and not the, uh, I don't know, uh, here the price is the target but you could, uh, if you would have some other categorical, uh, some other value like the mileage, don't know, you cannot replace it with a special category because it, has, uh, it is a numerical. Uh, you can do the averaging either with a uh, with a mode in the case that you have a discrete value or you can have a mean when you have if you have a continuous or the mode of a distribution in the case that you have a continuous uh, 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 attribute it's again simple and it is fast uh, if you have correlated values then you could lose key information and you could replace the information with something that does not make sense uh, so let's say that you have uh, two values and uh, you have a lot of data points here and other data points over there, okay? And then there is, there is some um, a data point in which you know one of those values, so you know that it is somewhere here, okay? Replacing the missing value, which is the second one, it is this, uh, with the average would put that data point, it would put it somewhere there in the middle, okay? Which is not where data points are. Is it understandable what I said? To whom is that clear? Or do I need to draw? Okay. To whom is this not clear? Okay. Um, yeah. So you have one uh, cloud here and another one cloud here. And then there is a point in which you know only one of those. So each of those points have two values, x1 and x2, right? Okay, understandable. Okay, now suppose that I know the x1 and I don't know the, and uh, I have the x2 is missing and I want to replace it with the average. What I would do, let's say that the x1 was here, okay? And then if I replace the x2 by the average, then I would create a point here. Is it understandable? This is what I would put in my data set. And this is a clear case in which the data is correlated. The dimensions are correlated, okay? Clear now? To the person that said no, yes, no. It's it's important. Okay, good. All right. Uh, fine. And the thing is that it is simplistic, and we are introducing now a new noise source. Okay, so we are introducing now things that might not that do not uh, exist. Okay. Um, fine. And of course, uh, what do we say? Like. Um, replacing with a mean or replacing with a median uh, does not make sense for some of the uh, yes so for example if we would replace now here the doors we will create an SUV with three doors which is never the case and 
an example is also here, we would create points that do not exist, basically, okay? And that would create, that would make the uh, job of the classifier or of the regressor or whatever process was after that more difficult. Uh, good. So instead of doing that averaging or uh, taking the mode uh, blindly, what we can do is that we can take the conditional average or the conditional mode and replace with the mode or the mean, uh, but uh, 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 conditioning it on the same target uh, on the same target value or conditioning it on some other of the attributes. Okay. So let's say that I'm going to, for example, replace the doors. Okay. This of this uh, category of this this missing value now. I'm going now to replace it, but taking into consideration and looking only at convertibles, for example, okay? Because I know that this is a convertible, I'm going to uh, condition it on this uh, thing, okay? And then you would take the uh, average or the mode for the convertibles. Or you could condition it on the make and then take the number of doors for Fords, okay? So of course, it is quite important now to pick up the correct condition, okay? Another thing that you could do is that condition it on the target. That's what I'm saying. That's what is stated here, depending on the same target value. This is the target in this situation. Understandable? Important to find out the correct condition. Can you tell me um, uh, one strategy that might uh, be useful, might be, that might make sense for picking up the attribute on which to condition? It's not in the slides. Whoops, sorry. I'm not going to ask you in the exam, but the, uh, the question is the following. So I know that this, this value is missing, and I want to replace it. OK. I can take the mode of all doors, or I can condition it on either the type, or I can condition it on the make. I could condition it on sale or not. Who will tell me now? what is a good strategy for making a condition? Of picking up the attribute on which I will take the condition. I want to see hands. So you're very enthusiastic. It's correlated, so the fault won't be correlated, but mm. the, the okay. size of the parable will vary. Yes. So one thing is to find out the correlation between the attribute that I want to replace and all the other attributes and to pick up the one that has the highest correlation or to has the highest another measure for that is mutual information in the case uh, um, uh, mutual information you can look at that we don't cover it but uh, it's something that uh, is useful okay is that understandable clear okay the more informative one okay good eh sorry was there a question uh -huh. Um, yes, but uh, so how many, how, okay. Uh, identifying how many data, how many, how many entries are uh, missing uh, is not a major cost in comparison to the cost of training classifiers. Or uh, uh, you need to examine the, your data, you need to examine them at least once. You need to see them at least once. And during the pass, you can easily identify, we assume that we can easily identify which values are missing and which values are not missing. We assume now, we will assume here, that it's going to be something that, that it is something characteristic there. That it will be either not a number, it will be not either minus one in the case that I'm supposed to find something positive, it will be uh, a value that we know that it is not in the range that we were expecting, and with a simple test we are able to identify that. In many situations, this is the case. Okay. Did I answer the question? Um, or was the question a bit differently? Either big or small data, if you cannot see the data, you don't have it. So at some point, you need to see the data. And we assume now that that data that you will see have their missing values marked. That's the assumption that we are making. Okay. Nice. And uh, 
and we can take it offline if, if, if this is, uh, how do you say, a little bit vague still to you. Okay. Any question? Okay. Cool. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So the way that I have described that, um, um, oops. Yes. So the way that I have described that now, condition it. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could use it uh, both. Actually, we, you could use it both for classification. You could use it also if you want to have a, 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 a regression. I need to update that a little bit. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, it is basically, and typically, it is better than now than replacing with with a mean or the mode. But it does not exploit now inter-attribute correlation, especially if you have correlation so uh, more than with correlations with more than one uh, uh, attributes. Okay. If you pick up and you condition it on the attribute to which it is that specific one is correlated, then it, it is okay. If you condition it on the target, as I as I put here, only on the target, then it is uh, it is an issue. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh -huh. and I say that, and I say here that it is used only for classification, because I put them. I say that. It is I con um, because I say that it is conditioned on the target. So, for example, in the case of in this case, I condition it on a categorical value on which I can uh, easily condition. So I can pick up the entries here that they have the same categorical value. Okay, if I would have if the uh, if this was a price, if this was a number, then it would be di more difficult to cons to to uh, and in general, it is more difficult to condition on something that it is continuous. Because it is very difficult to find the exact value. Okay, is that understandable? To whom is that not clear? Okay, good. Okay. Yes. So, can I make that your slow, zero, or O in terms of the end? So, even zero or one, what does that mean? Um, okay, so O of N. Um, Basically, what the O, what the O of n means, uh, is that the computational cost, okay, of doing something, it is a function of n, okay. And what I'm saying is that for every situation, for each value of n, there exists a number a such that the cost is smaller or equal than the a times n. Is this understandable? And this means that the cost is. Uh, less than linear with respect to the parameter that it is here. Is that clear? Yes? Is that clear or not? Yes? So basically if I have n data, n data entries, then the cost of making now this uh, 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 substitution is, uh, uh, how it is called, is O of n. It's understandable because if I want to substitute this value, then what I need to do is that I need to go to this. Okay, I need to search all my data and find out which ones have the same value uh, in the condition variable. And then I need to take the average, for example, of the doors and then put that in the condition here, in the, in the, in the missing value. Okay, which means that I need to go through all my data this is where the n comes. Okay. Then let's say I would need to go again through my data. Then I would have two times n. Okay. And that's why I have the a times n here. It's understandable. And each of those operations, let's say that it will take some time. And all of those, the time that each of those operations would take is contained now in this alpha factor here. Understandable? Okay. If it would depend on the number of attributes, then I would have to put something here that is called D, okay? That, has, that it is related to the number of attributes. If, uh, if I would need to go every, uh, 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 so for, for each one of, if I would have to go to pairs of those, it can be that that would be N, N squared. Do you understand? Okay, 
But in any case, then that would mean that uh, I would have here n squared times n. Okay? Clear? Cool. Um, okay. Um, yeah? All right. Hmm. Another uh, strategy. Another cra strategy now is to replace it now with the corresponding um, uh, um, how do you say that? Corresponding values from the nearest neighbors. What do I do? Is for uh, the point of interest, I find the k nearest neighbors in the data using the available attributes, okay? And then from those, I see what is the mode or the average, depending on what kind of data I have, in the remaining, in the, attribu in the missing attributes. And then I replace it. Clear? Yes? Okay. Find the nearest neighbors and in general the KNN classifier, the KNN regressor, uh, the KNN for used for density estimator. These are not, uh, they are very, very simple. They are very uh, fundamental. They are very um, uh, primitive. But uh, I don't know, not to be ignored, okay? So remember it that uh, it is there at the hard times and uh, perhaps you can uh, do something quick and dirty. This is uh, something that you can do, okay? Uh, good, but the problem is, of course, the problem is that it is very, 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 very slow, okay? So for each time that you need to find out now where the, uh, to replace a missing value, then you would need to uh, find the k nearest, uh, k nearest neighbors of a specific data point. And that can be tricky, okay? There are some representations that can make that uh, search for the nearest neighbor faster. So for example, you have things like uh, KD trees uh, for uh, finding uh, nearest neighbors uh, quite fast. Uh, but uh, in general, a naive implementation would take a lot of time. Um, okay, and having now the nearest neighbor matching could be also noisy. Why? Because you have those uh, missing, values, uh, missing values as well. And the other one is to use uh, clustering. So having um, the data, some of the values will be missing, but in any case you make, you find clusters. And then for a, a new data point, uh, the values of which are missing, some are missing, you find to which cluster it belongs, okay? And then replace the values, <coughs> like the missing values, with the mean or the mode of the uh, points that are in the corresponding cluster. Okay. Uh, it is uh, slow to do the clustering, okay? But once you have the clustering, then you can make uh, very uh, easily to the, uh, 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 to make the, um, how do you say that? To, to find the missing values for incoming data. So this, for example, could be quite useful in the case that you want to deal with missing values at testing, yes? So during testing, what you would do is that you would find the k nearest, the, the, sorry, the nearest uh, cluster. How fast would that be? You have to compare with k centers, right? You don't here need to compare with all data points, that can be fast. And for each of those data points, then you have the mean or the mode, and then you go and you replace it with. Okay. Understandable? Um, good. Now remember, no, observe that you would need to change now the steps of the Keynes algorithm to alter them a little bit, because also, not also, if you assume that the training data have also missing values. You have to change it in two uh, ways. So first of all, when you're, having, uh, when you're calculating the distance of a point to the nearest centroid, if some values of the points are missing, then you have to calculate the distance based on the remaining attributes, right? 
And when you calculate the mean for a cluster, then uh, some of the values of the points that are assigned to it will be missing. Well, you will calculate the mean based on the, uh, so when you calculate the mean for the first attribute, we will calculate only based on only the known values, the values that are, be, that are given. Is it understandable? To whom was that clear? Just, okay, to whom was it was not clear? Really, there was nobody that is wondering now. Okay, good. Thank you. And yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. And the other thing now that you can do is that you can, uh, in as we did with the k nearest neighbors, for example, we could do also a predictive. Uh, model in which now we predict the missing attributes. So basically what we will do is that we are going to make, in the case that this is missing, we are going to make a classifier, let's say, that based on some other attributes, we are going to predict the make. Okay, it's understandable. And then uh, when uh, a missing value is miss and a missing value comes, then you will use the remaining ones in order to predict the one is missing, okay? Of course, it's a little bit uh, tricky now. Why? Because you have you have to choose now which are the attributes that are going to predict the which attributes will predict which other attributes. Okay, and that can be uh, uh, problematic. So uh, uh, either you can you can have d classifiers or d regressors or uh, one regressor for each that uses all other attributes to predict the one that is missing, okay? Or what you can do is that you can have all of those two to the power of D classifier. So which means that for predicting the doors, first I will use only the type to predict the doors. Then I will use the make to predict the doors. I will use the type and the make to predict the doors. I will use the, you understand? all possible combinations of other uh, uh, attributes in order to predict the one that it is uh, missing, okay? And for each one of those, you're going to have again the same problem, um, uh, not the same problem, the same issue, okay? Which means that some of the values are going to be missing. So when you're trying to predict the doors based on the type and the make, here you will have a missing uh, attribute, okay? So there, the strategies that we had before will apply as well. Understandable? Okay. And that's it. Okay. Fine. Of course, you don't need to have to make that. You don't need to make all of those uh, uh, classifiers. Okay. Again, what I said about uh, making correlations between, finding correlations or mutual information between different attributes could help you choose which attributes will be used in order to predict the other ones, the ones that are missing. Uh, okay, fine, good. And some of them, some of them uh, methodologies that you can apply are dependent on the specific methodology that you use for the problem that you have in hand. So let's say that we want to have a classifier now, or no, what is that? Yes, a classifier in which um, uh, here are the attributes and this is the predicted, predicted uh, 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 class. Okay. Uh, some of the classifiers are more robust than others and are more easily, uh, uh, can be more easily adjusted to missing values. One of them is the naive base. Did you remember what we do with the naive base? With the naive base, we consider it's, it's featured independently. Okay. And we are making the probability of the uh, uh, class, okay, based on each individual um, 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 uh, attribute, okay. We calculate the probability, uh, well, basically this is what we do, we can make a uh, 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 likelihood given a certain class and then we use that formula here to calculate now the probability for a new data item, okay. So in the case that some of the i's, some of the attributes are missing, well, take the product now 
only over the visible features. Is it understandable? So what you do in the, in the naive base classifier is you have those probabilities now for each of the attributes. So you have the probability of low uh, given the, uh, sorry, the probability, yes, the probability of uh, two rooms given uh, low, the probability of four rooms given low, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the case of the probability of all the uh, data uh, I, uh, uh, dimensions, uh, let's say, uh, in the case that some of them are missing, then disregard that and take the other products, and that's it. Understandable? That's it. And that's not a hack, basically. This <laughs> Uh, fine. Okay, yeah. And another thing, and this is quite a uh, uh, good strategy, and we touched on that in the previous slide as well, is to make several now independent models, classifier or regressor, for subsets of uh, data dimensions and for subset of the data even, okay? So basically what you do is that you can pick some of the dimensions or you can pick some of the data and you can make a classifier uh, based on that subset of data and dimensions, okay? And you can make another classifier that will take into consideration only the room and the square meters for example, and another one that is and only those uh, data points, or in, and another one that takes further data points, etc., etc. And then in the end, what you will do is that you will combine those decisions, uh, well, for example, by taking the average in the case of that you have a regression, or taking the mode in the case that you have a classification problem. Is it understandable? And in general, this is, and samples are in general, this uh, collections of uh, model, is not a bad thing to have, as we are going to see in um, a little while. Okay. Good. I'll let you think about that for a second, for, for five seconds. Okay, are we happy with this? Do we know how to, fit to deal with the missing values? Uh, yeah. Good. So now we're going to see how we're going to deal with outliers. Okay, we have touched a little bit on that. We have seen a few techniques already. I think we know already a little bit about what to do. Uh, so the first thing is, what do we call outliers, and why does this matter? So the problem is that with some uh, methodologies, if you, and in some cases even a single unusual example, can dramatically distort the outcome, can dramatically alter how my decision boundary or my regressor would look like. Okay, an example is here which is called the famous Belgian phone call data. And this is what the Belgian phone call data are, which was the phone calls, tens of million uh, uh, phone calls, uh, recorded from 1950 until uh, later. Okay. And this is the data in the subsequent years. And then you see a sudden jump in 1960-something that was going like that. And then in the next years, it was like this. Okay. So you can uh, see that, well, if you just look at the picture, then you can see already that there is a problem there. And the actual problem is that during that period, what was recorded is was the 
number of minutes rather than the number of calls. Okay, and for this reason, and these are mistakes that can be that can be made. And if you do not have a way of, uh, I mean, in that case, this is quite easy to spot because if you can, if you are able to plot the data, okay. But if you have uh, several dimensions, some five and thousands, thousands of dimensions, then you don't. Then sometimes, not sometimes, you cannot really plot and uh, just rely on your uh, vision, let's say, to spot what, that something that is going wrong. Okay. And the problem is now that if you would fit a linear model, uh, this looks like, well, it looks like a linear model. Then uh, this is a linear model fitted on the correct data. Okay, if we ignore those guys, okay. And this is what you would get if you would fit it, taking those also into consideration, okay? Because what does the linear regression does if we, if you, if we consider now the sum of the square uh, uh, distances, some of the square error as a criterion. It is trying to minimize the sum of the squares of the distances between the predicted value and the actual value. Sum of the square distances, okay. And of course this line is not, is very large distances and very large squares of distances to that data. Understandable? Okay. Good. And especially those criterion, so the square of the error is particularly, not particularly, there are other ones that are even more sensitive, but in any case, this is quite sensitive to those uh, so-called outliers, those uh, wrong uh, measurements. Okay. So what can we do? Anybody can think of something? <coughs> discard. What will we discard though? Okay, that's what we want, but we want a procedure for doing that. So you have to dis we have to describe that now in, uh, um, how do you say that? In algorithmic terms. Okay. So in the case of uh, missing values, we could say that if I see a missing value, then I discard that data. But here, what do I say? Tell me. Can we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's uh, the how did you say a sketch of a valid idea? Yeah. Tell me. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so the problem is what, okay, maybe we didn't understand that. Yes, uh, uh, it is minutes rather than the number of calls, and uh, the, but the problem is that uh, when the data was collected then, uh, and they were when they were trying to fit a linear model to it, they didn't realize that there were different measures. That's the, that's the problem, okay. After you have realized that, yes. But the point is now, let's say that this is that they give it to you like that, okay? And you don't know that this, that you don't know the underlying cause and you do not know that these are wrong uh, measurements. That's the problem. If I knew now that this is what, that these are means, then I could, uh, uh, maybe that's what you meant, yes. If I knew that these were, that, uh, that, that those are minutes of call instead of number of calls, then yes, I could uh, discard them, yes. And then I would fit, with the remaining points, yes. Okay, so the question is now is how can I identify that these are, they do not follow the trend? That's the question. And uh, the answer are that, uh, yes, tell me. Mm -hmm. It worked before, but you can fit a Gaussian and see if uh, there are any points that are further down to some number of standard deviations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so yes, that's uh, another uh, useful idea and we're going to see that as well, yes. Yes, okay, so these are two, two we had two good ideas uh, here and uh, that they form, that they fit, uh, that they form um, 
how do you say that, the backbone of several uh, methodologies. So the one is uh, you fit a data, you fit a data line, okay? You discard things that are far, you have to fit, you have to have some fit at some point, okay? You discard ones that are far away from it, and then you fit with the remaining, and then you can do it a few times as well. Or what you can do is that you can do the, or you can do this, okay? So you fit a Gaussian or you fit a GMM, you check the likelihood, you exclude the anomalous data, and then train them with the supervised learner with the remaining data. That's a procedure that you could be using. Okay. Uh, good. Okay. So, in general, to, so to use in general an anomaly detection, uh, 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 an anomaly detection, uh, an anomaly detection uh, algorithm. So the thing is that where you put the threshold, how many counts, uh, if you co consider as too unlikely, when you decide when to, after you have uh, described your uh, data in an unsupervised way, how can you decide which ones are the uh, outliers? So in the case now that uh, of a Gaussian, uh, of a Gaussian, of a Gaussian modeling, uh, we can, and there are closed form formulas for saying that uh, if I have modeled my data with a Gaussian, let's say that I have this is my data, and then I have modeled it with a Gaussian, I know that if I set the threshold at a specific thing, then data that are generated with a Gaussian uh, uh, that are outside this uh, uh, line, uh, I can uh, know what is the probability that they occur. So I can put up, I can take the threshold such that only, I don't know, 1% or 0.5% or 0.2% of the data points that would be generated by that Gaussian are outside the line, okay? So in the case of the Gaussian, I know where to take the thresholds, okay? Uh, but only in the case that I have a Gaussian. And maybe perhaps maybe you can see it in this, in this, in this diagram here in which the probability that a point is outside uh, outside a certain uh, a certain range from the mean, a certain distance from the mean, is given by the by this area. Okay, so you can say that if you pick up now the threshold accordingly or this threshold accordingly, then you can say that this area here it is the 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Okay, so you can. Uh, basically uh, deal with that in this way. Okay, so, uh, and in the case, let's say, that you have uh, a lot of data, okay, uh, and this, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you fit, you could fit, again, a, a Gaussian, if you know that the data do not really follow Gaussian, then what you can say is that I'm going to pick up, I'm going to set the threshold such that the top k or the top k percent of the uh, of the uh, of the of the actual observations are outside that uh, uh, range. Okay, is it understandable? So in the case of the previous example, I would fit the data. I would fit. So I fit a Gaussian to all the data that I have. I exclude the top k or the top k percent of, the, of them, okay? And then I do the supervised learning with the remaining ones. Is that clear? To everybody? To somebody not? Good. Okay. So of course, by doing that, then the, uh, I may have somebody that is outlier or not, okay? Or it can be rare, but can be also important. If I fit a Gaussian or if I fit a mixture of Gaussians, I may reject in this way some, me some I, I reject in this way some measurements. They can be, but they cannot, but they might also not be uh, outliers, right? Uh, this is something that we do not know in advance. It can be that I mean, then maybe there are not even uh, at all outliers in the data that I have. Okay. So in this way, I could lose also key data. 
So what I could do is that I could do cross-validation, but it can be also expensive. And in some cases, I might not even, uh, uh, even after that, I might not know. But this is, if I don't have a ground truth annotation of what is outlier and what is not outlier, there is only so much that I can do. Okay. At some point, it is also a matter of uh, guess. Okay. Um, Good. So these were the methodologies that that uh, are these, for example, fitting uh, uh, a Gaussian, uh, or what uh, the outline of the previous methodology was with fitting a line and rejecting things that are very far away, were independent of the um, actual methodology. Now, in some cases, you can deal with outliers by uh, changing things inside specific methods. Okay, so what I'm going to say to you now are things that you can do for specific methods. So this is something that you can do in the case of a linear uh, 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 regressor. Okay, uh, so if you remember, so a linear regressor makes a prediction wt times x, right? So it takes a point x and then it multiplies with the weights w and wt times x is the prediction. And it is trained by minimizing, finding the w that minimizes this error here. Everybody remembers that? Okay. Is this a formula mystery to somebody? No? Everybody knows it? Okay. So in this formula now, let's say that this is the data, okay? And this looks like a correct line for fitting the data because this guy is an outlier, right? Okay? So another point is that if this is unit, if this distance, if the error, if sorry, is the if the residual, that's called the re residual, uh, is the difference between the prediction and the actual value. Okay? If that has 10 units, okay? Then using the mean square error as a criterion, it will assign that it will take that and it will take the square of that. So it will assign a, a penalty. It would have that it would be uh, 100, okay? And for this reason, this is the line that it would generate, okay? It would be drawn very it would be drawn by one measure quite dramatically. Okay. Now, if we don't minimize the square deviation and we minimize the absolute value deviation, then the error would be that. And for, and the distance now for, okay, a 10 unit deviation, it would give a, so a 10 unit uh, residual, it would give a 10 a penalty of uh, 10, okay? Which means that, okay, that the line that you would fit in that case would be something that would look more to the real one, to the correct one, it would uh, be the orange line, okay? The problem with that, not the problem with that, I mean, it, yes. Yes, it should be divided uh, by the number of, uh, but uh, the solution does not change. But for uh, uh, stability and for uh, treating it uh, in uh, a more. So if I have one over n, where n are the number of points, the w that minimizes the one over n times this, it is the same w that minimizes the sum without the one over n. Okay, that's why I say that it does not make a difference. If you, uh, do you remember which way? How do we uh, optimize with respect to w? There are two ways: either we follow the gradient, or we take the closed form solution. If you take the closed form solution. Either you have the one over n here or not, you will end up with the same solution. Okay, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. In the case that you have the gradient, then what you would have, in the one case, it, the gradient would be multiplied by n, and in the other case, it would not be multiplied by n. But because you take a step that it is 
a times the gradient. In the case, you could adjust the a to take into consideration the number of points, let's say. Okay, so in the end it doesn't matter, but it is a good practice to have one over n, because in that case then the, uh, your uh, alpha, so your uh, uh, step, uh, 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 the learning rate, would be independent of the number of points. You would not have to adjust it every time that uh, you, uh, every time you have a data set that it is smaller or, l or, 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 or larger. Does it make sense? I can explain that in more detail if you want later. Tell me. Yes. Why do we use the square deviation at all like before? Yeah, okay. So that's a very good question. In some cases it gives a more uh, it gives a better uh, solution, in some cases it does not give a better solution. In general it is better to the outliers. But this does not mean though that uh, in uh, um, how can I say that that in some problems in which the effect of outliers is not that great, so there are not many outliers for example, the square, uh, uh, the sum of the, uh, of the squares can, can lead to better uh, and more uh, stable, let's say, solutions, if that makes sense. Another thing is that uh, the gradients, so the, um, uh, yeah, so the, um, the, uh, so the, mean, the, the square, is something that it is uh, that uh, that it that uh, that uh, it does not have a discontinuity at zero, while the uh, uh, absolute value has a discontinuity at zero. So you cannot take derivatives uh, close to zero, and that is a little bit problematic as well. Okay, uh, current optimization algorithms they take that into consideration, but it's still not a uh, resolved uh, uh, issue. Okay, uh, uh, fine. And in the case that you do not have many outliers, but you are far away from the solution, from the correct solution, then the uh, square is a little bit better because it gives you gradients that are large when you're far away and it can get you quicker to the, to the, to, to the, correct, to the correct solution. Do we have any question? More? No? Uh, okay. So these are examples, and these are examples now of um, actual case studies in which what we were trying to find, not me, but uh, other people in the, in the computer vision basically group, uh, they were uh, given, so this specific uh, project that was very, very similar to that uh, was last year of a student of mine as well, but not with a linear classifier. So basically the main, so with a linear regressor. So the main idea now is that you have images and then you were trying to uh, predict basically how interesting uh, is the, uh, each one of those uh, images, okay? And you had image features. You were uh, putting them for in a vector form for each one of those images. You were giving them to a linear uh, uh, regressor and then you could, it could predict now how interesting uh, the uh, outcome is. In the case of my students, she did a deep neural network, extract features from those, and then you could use those features in a linear regressor or a classifier in which the target during training could be the number of likes. Okay. Understandable? Good. That's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, let's make a five minutes break. Unless there are questions, or you can think the questions during the break, and then we will, I will take them as we start the next uh, hour about uh, ensembles. <coughs> Calculate the likelihood of all these other boys. And the ones that have the lowest 
k percent uh, one minus k percent uh, like it which is this happen Yeah, machine learning. Uh, um, I don't know. It's too much work. It's too much 
But like Pedro was kind of the, the number that was easy to take notes. So you could just write the slide number and write okay. it. Okay. Don't worry. No, no, it's a uh, shot. I, I just uh, I will try. <laughs> You need to plot the data, you need to calculate the distance with all the other uh, data. The K and N does not need to plot the data and look with the, with the eye. You need to calculate distances. Okay, but I should have to scan, then I can the distance. Yes. But I one attribute So you find according to the other attributes. the position For the other attributes. So let's say so that... basically the whole column for the
Ok. Okay, so let's start. So let's start about ensembles, and we are going to see a few uh, issues here. Let's start with the most uh, fundamental one, which is about uh, bagging and uh, uh, randomization, and we're going to see about decision forest as well. Uh, so we talked about uh, overfitting, underfitting, and another way of uh, seeing that uh, issue is uh, with uh, the balance between the uh, bias and uh, variance. Okay, so the bias is how much uh, a model is tends to learn the same wrong thing, okay? So for example, if we try to fit a now linear model to, to a curve, okay? That is a bias because it does not, uh, it cannot, uh, it is related to underfitting. And the variance now is that, uh, uh, the variance now is the tendency of a model to learn random fluctuations that are independent of the underlying uh, signal. So this is related to overfitting. Uh, and this is uh, basically every time that you fit a, a model like a decision tree, especially if it is very complicated, then you're getting to tend to now quite different tree. So this is, uh, uh, well, if you see it in terms of uh, like a dart uh, throwing, uh, that's what you want to have. You want to have a model that gives, uh, that it is, uh, the distance to the correct one is small and all, in all cases, it gets uh, the uh, same, uh, how did you say, the same, uh, the same errors. In this case, we have low variance, so you have the same answers all the time, okay, but they are wrong, quite wrong, okay. Here, every time you get different answers and they are also wrong, that's not good. Uh, and here you have different answers. Each one, each answer give uh, different uh, uh, is different. Okay, and it has a uh, large error. But the thing is that the error is not structured, so every time it is uh, different. Okay. Another thing is that if you have, so ideally you would have some zero bias and zero variance. And the main idea now is that you have uh, that you use ensembles. What are the ensembles? Are uh, collections of models. And if you have collections of models, means that you have, uh, that uh, you're going to use a committee, sort of all of them, and combining their decisions that you're going to get into a better answer. So for example, answering, <coughs> if this was the case, and you would have uh, uncorrelated but unbiased uh, uh, models. And if you would average, for example, their decisions, that you would get something that has, as a collection now, has uh, uh, low uh, variance and also in that case, if they were uncorrelated, then you would have also smaller error. So the idea is now that if the expert errors are uncorrelated, then the, and the, col the collective vote would average their errors. And if they would average the errors and the errors were uncorrelated, then the resulting one would be small. Okay, this is the That's the main idea. That's it. So each individual expert should have a high variance. But the committee is of low variance. Okay. <clears throat> so we have to, and they are good, of course. Okay. It, this whole idea works. If each of the members of the committee, each of the members of the ensemble, is uh, uh, not correlated to the other one. So you have a committee in that it is diverse and it gives uncorrelated predictions. Okay. It doesn't work if you have a committee in which they talk to each other and then they reach the same decisions because they, reach, they can reach the same uh, uh, wrong decision or in any case, it is not better than a single one of them. So do you, let's say that you have a model. Do you have any idea about how we can make uh, the model to generate uh, uh, different and diverse predictions? We're going to see some examples here. So the one is to use the bagging, which is called uh, bootstrap uh, aggregation. 
And the idea is now that we are going to train each of the individual, so we're going to keep one model, let's say linear regression, but we are going to train it now with different subsets of the data. Is this understandable? So we have, suppose that we have n data and we're going to take k random samples, uh, k random samples of size n with replacement, which means that uh, 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 we are going to train k model. Each of those models is going to be uh, trained on, e on one specific uh, set, okay? Uh, and in the end, we are going to average the, uh, uh, the decisions of the model. So each one of the models, let's say in the case of the regression, is going to be a higher order polynomial. It is going to be trained with a few of those data points, not all, not all of them, okay? Uh, I'm going to, s to tell you how we pick up which points to uh, select, to, to train on. Um, each of the models is going to be one line and averaging those lines, uh, the uh, gray lines, which, which you see that they have a lot of variance, they are give a red curve, which is a much better estimate than each individual one. Understandable? Tell me. Uh, this is not cross validation because in cross validation you would use the you would pick up the best. Okay. Uh, so here you're averaging, and this is how you pick up the. Uh, how do you say that? This is how you pick up uh, data points. The idea is that this is the original data set. So what you go is that you go through. Uh, these are the data points. And then here, what you do is that you pick up the first one, you pick up randomly with um, a probability one out of 10 from all of those data sets that were in the original data set. You pick up the one. The second uh, point, you pick up randomly one of those and you put it here, you pick number 10. Randomly one of those and you put it here, you pick up random seven, uh, number seven. Randomly and you pick up number three. Randomly and you pick up number 10. Oh, you see? that we pick up number 10 twice, and it may happen that we can pick it three times or many times. Is it understandable? This does not matter. Clear? To whom is that clear? To, to, sorry, to whom is it not clear? It's not clear, okay? So what we do is that we need to fill in ten, 10 positions. For each of those positions, we pick up one of those points with probability one out of 10, as many points are here, okay? Because we do that and because the decision that we make at each position is independent of the other ones, it may happen that we pick up the 10 twice. Is that clear? Okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah what can I say? So it means that some of them are unselected. Well, that's okay. So this is called a random sample with replacement. That's what it is. That's how it is called. Uh, fine, and this is the general thing. So you have different uh, learners. Each one of those learners is learned with a different data, with a different uh, data instances. And then in the end, they vote. Either they take the average, as I said in the previous slide, or they can take the mode in the case that you have a discrete classification problem. Uh, and this is an illustration, so you have some of the data, you pick up several of those, you take a decision boundary, another model would give those, if those data were picked, then this decision boundary would be made, and this is another decision boundary, and this is another, several of those decision boundaries, and then in the end, what would happen is that at each position, you would average the decisions that would be made by those uh, yellow, uh, blue, blue lines. Okay, clear? Yes? Okay. And the decision boundary, you see that it can be quite complex now, it is not linear. Okay, fine. Now in order to, for this to work, okay, it requires now that the base models, that they can be a bit Complex, so they have to be a bit. Um, uh, they have to have uh, uh, a bit high capacity. 
to be able to draw um, complex uh, uh, boundaries, okay? And for example, so to create you know, this uh, diversity in the expert, so for example, one is one of those models is a decision tree, okay? And each of the model, if the, each of the members of the committee is going to be likely, is going to be worse than a full model, but collectively that's the idea that they will do better. Understandable? Good. Okay. So the ensemble now, they can have different, they can have, it will have similar bias now, but it will have a reduced uh, uh, variance. Uh, fine. And there is a trade-off here. If we have small bugs, which means small, uh, uh, a bug is a sample that we draw from the original data set. Uh, if we have small bugs, then we have small, we have worse models, okay, because we use fewer data. And the likelihood of having overfitting to that data is uh, higher. Okay. So we have worse models, but we are going to have more diversity. And the big bugs, we have better models, but less diversity. And there is a trade-off there. And we have to do things like cross-validation uh, in order to see which one is better for the problem. OK. So this was a, a way of introducing diversity, was to select randomly the uh, a sample, select randomly uh, the data set. But, uh, um, uh, other things that we can uh, randomize? I give the answer in uh, <laughs> the next click of the mouse. And that is, we can randomize the attributes. So we can, can we can uh, each of those experts can be trained on a random subset of attributes and a random subset of dimensions. This is similar to you remember when we were saying about fi uh, fitting uh, a mix, mix missing value. We can pick up certain attributes and then train a classifier or a regressor there. We have several of those and then average the decisions. Okay, this is also an interesting and powerful methodology. And by the way, it could be also be used. It could be useful in the case that you have missing values as well, right? Because then, the, if you would have some of the ensembles, you were not going to, you could not, you could ignore if uh, a missing value would affect them. Okay but there would be some of them that would not be affected. And you can have other ways also for uh, uh, having introducing a diversity. So for example, picking up which model we have. Uh, you could have combinations, for example, of decision trees, of uh, logistic regression, of base, of KNN. You could add noise to the data. You can, there are several things that you could be doing in order to increase the diversity. Okay, fine. So one of the things is that we said that uh, we take the average or we take the vote of each of the model, of each of the expert. There are some things also that we could uh, change. Here I put them in to say that they could do better. But the thing is that um, uh, some experts are more experts than others. Okay, and uh, in that case it might be better to put a higher weight to their uh, uh, decisions. So for example, we could have a weighted vote, okay? Do you think of how we could decide the weights? How can we decide the weights? Okay, so that's one answer. Based on the errors, we look at the errors and then we try to assign higher weights to the ones that make smaller errors, okay? That's a bad strategy. Somebody else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you choose the subset in a similar way that you choose uh, the attributes in dimensionality with subsequent attributes argument, you can assign a higher weighted combination for the two. I think it's uh, more or less though these li the lines that um, uh, uh, she is thinking, because uh, you are saying better predictive power. Uh, 
it means that you are looking at the result of the classifier is or you or you mean something else okay okay maybe you meant maybe you mean something else maybe if you try to formalize it and think it in your mind maybe something better or different will emerge sometimes uh, you know if you have something in our mind and we cannot express it very well but m there might be some idea there that is different than uh, what uh, has been expressed uh, at this moment I'm not able to understand it but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense it, it can be something that is different and uh, being ser I'm serious now I haven't thought of that okay um, so uh, that's a valid uh, way so we could see which one of those are uh, uh, better and then assign a weight to their decisions based on the error now we have to translate now a quantity that it is the error and has a certain range into a weight okay and there are ways of doing that which I'm not going to explain here but I will tell if we are uh, to whoever is interesting interested afterwards okay so for example you could have one uh, strategy to do that is to have e to the minus uh, of the error okay and then divide with the sum of the e to the uh, minus the error and in this way you translate something that it is large the error into something that it is uh, uh, so if the error is large that quantity that I have just told you is small and the sum of those sum up to one okay did you understand who understood what I said who didn't okay so uh, in general if you have quantities that uh, are large and this is the error one error two error sorry error one error two error three okay and you want to make them into values here that sum up to one okay because that's something that is also quite important in in, in the case that i'm taking the uh, average of the decisions uh, what was I saying yes and the other property is that whenever you have something large here then you need to have something small here the strategy of doing that is to have e to the minus error one and then here you would have a scaling factor that is going to be a sigma okay and then this is going to be your vector and then you will multiply with one over z and the one over z is the sum of all the uh, epsilon i minus sigma uh, i does it make sense so you calculate this quantity from this you calculate this quantity and then you uh, uh, and then you normalize with the sum of those quantities so that you make sure that they sum up to one okay this is a standard trick for going from errors for example into uh, weights okay um, is it clear okay good but uh, that's not what we have in the slide here and I said that <laughs> because it came uh, I didn't plan to say that but uh, since it came then uh, I explained uh, so the thing is that now what you can do now is that you have several decisions that come out from individual learners so let's say those learners okay and what you can have is that you can combine them now use this as attributes in another learner and that learner can be a linear model as it is described here what is that this is a function now that combines with linear weights different features these are no these are not the features so the f of a certain classifier let's say is the output of that classifier and then we want to linearly combine them with different weights w well basically it is as if we train now a linear classifier now with having those as attributes right okay it's understandable and you will have a sigmoid there if we have a classifier this would be a linear regressor to be more specific okay so we train use those as attributes to have a meta learner and then we make a prediction in general is this clear to whom is that clear good very standard very easy very uh, fundamental methodology uh, good so the meta learner takes as input the vector of the estimated classes from a bank of base learners okay and what it outputs it outputs a prediction okay now uh, uh, this is quite complex model and it is typically trained in two, two stages first those ones are trained and then this is trained 
this, because the whole model can be quite complex, this one typically is a linear model, okay? Does not have to be, but typically it is a linear model. And it is also easy to, uh, as because it is easy to overfit, okay? Uh, again, things like cross-validation is essential. This is now should be bread and butter for you, okay? Uh, good. And this is the, I don't remember, no, 2009, this kind of uh, methodology that is called stacking. Why it is called stacking? It is because you have one layer and then you stack another layer on top of, on, on top of that. Uh, and this is what won now the $1 million dollar, dollar, dollars price in, the, in 2009. Okay. And you <coughs> basically a lot of top ranked models, combine them with stacking. It, used, it was a winning algorithm, but it didn't use that because it was too expensive, because you have a lot of, so you have for uh, something you need to apply eight different models and then to combine them, and then to use them in order to have the next uh, layer. That was too computationally complex and they didn't use it. So, okay, Are we know about stacking. We know about stacking. We know about um, uh, ensembles. We know about ensembles. And we are going to talk now about some specific ensembles that are called random forests. And random forests were, think about neural networks in, uh, uh, what's the year now? Six years ago. Six years ago, everything was random forests. Okay. And still they are quite uh, uh, strong. And uh, I think that, I don't know. They will, they will, they will make, um, no, I don't, I don't want to be on record while I'm making predictions about the future. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is a powerful, uh, it, it is really, a, it is a powerful methodology. Ah, and by the way, uh, also for neural networks, uh, several uh, um, In different domains and different problems, it can be shown that having ensembles of uh, neural networks also does a good, uh, is, is, is beneficial, okay? Uh, <coughs> of course, the point is that then you have to have two and three versions of the same network with different weights, et cetera, et cetera, which means that, well, why don't just one network with just double the capacity? And there is where it uh, breaks down. But in any case, the ensembles are uh, quite uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, okay, so um, random forests are a special case of a decision, not special case, oh no, sorry, forget about that. Um, um, so first of all, random forest. Forest is because it is a collection of trees, of decision trees, that's why we call them forest. Okay. And we call them random forest because there is a kind of randomness in them. And so we'll explain now what kind of randomness is there, okay? So you have an array of decision trees and you average the prediction at the test time. Okay, an ensemble of, of decision trees. So the thing is that it is random because there is some diversity there and the diversity comes from uh, randomizing two things. Randomizing the instances, okay? So each tree is trained on different instances, for example, with bugging, okay? And the other thing is that each tree is trained with different dimensions. So either you can pick up the dimension on which you are, um, 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 so you say like this tree is going to be trained on those dimensions. Or another thing that you can be doing is that when you're going down the tree, okay, you're here and at each node of the tree, then you are deciding randomly on which dimension you are going to split the decision, you're going, you going to make the decision and then finding, for example, the optimal threshold for that. Or what you can do is that, and in several cases this has been done, uh, pick up randomly both the dimension and the uh, uh, threshold on which you are making the uh, uh, decision. It's understandable. And that was an that, um, extreme randomization uh, process. And that's it, basically. So they have good, really good accuracy. And it was, it was state of the art by a large margin in 2012, 2013. Uh, it was really good. Um, 
in comparison to the decision trees, if we have a forest, then it is not easy to interpret it because, well, you're combining with different textures, but then you do not know how the, you, know, you, you may know how the decision of each expert is done because you know that they have said that, well, if this attribute is like this, then you take this decision and you go to here and there and blah, blah, blah. But if you have several of them, then it becomes quite complex. So it's not interpretable anymore. And uh, it can be expensive to train many trees. It is parallelizable. So this is not really a big, uh, a very big uh, uh, issue. And in any case, not larger issue than is for uh, neural networks, okay? Uh, why is it parallelizable? Who will answer that? You can generate each tree at the same time, at a, you know, at the different uh, machines, for example, okay? So the training one tree is independent of all the other trees, okay? That's, that's the reason. That's why they can be done in parallel, okay? All right. Uh, good, in general, if you have large, uh, uh, committees then you can make uh, uh, so you have different trade-offs if you have large committees you can make better aggregate decisions but it is also slower both to train and to test okay this is one example of um, um, with um, I don't remember now I think it's random forest how the performance goes as the number of forest, a number of trees uh, increase then you can see that somewhere here saturates but uh, in case that you want to have, uh, 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 okay. And of course, if you have hundred trees, if you do not have something to uh, a parallel machine to do them in parallel, then you do not. Then uh, uh, you need hundreds of hundreds times the computational complexity of a single tree, right? Okay, that should be uh, clear. Let me see. Okay. Uh, good. Now, decision forest, well, decision trees or uh, forest ensemble was used in. Who can start? Who knows about the Kinect? Who does not know about Kinect? Okay. So, Kinect is a special type of a camera uh, that has uh, an RGB component that it has, oh, sorry, I think, let me see, yes, it has an RGB camera. And it has also two uh, other uh, and, and another infrared uh, camera, and it has also um, how do you say that? It has also um, uh, an emitter that emits uh, patterns of uh, of uh, uh, light. This is called structured light, and the camera then records that. And based on the formation of it, then and an algorithm basically, then it can decide the uh, distance from the uh, uh, of each position that it is recorded from the camera. Okay, so it measures it is a depth uh, sensor as well together with an RGB sensor. Is that understandable? Yes, to everybody, even to the people that didn't know. So basically it is a depth sensor, let's put it this way, okay? So it is a camera that senses the distance of the objects to it, okay? So it has been used, it had been developed uh, originally, not yet, it has been uh, uh, used by, uh, 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 by Microsoft and with an algorithm that was developed in the uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Research uh, Center in uh, Cambridge as a matter of fact. They, uh, by this uh, guy here, okay. They used it in order to locate the joints of the human body with very high accuracy. And this then was used in order to control, uh, to use your body as a sensor for, to as a controller for games, okay? This was the first one and made a, ma it made a major breakthrough, okay? It was working real time, was working really well, was having very good uh, 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 precision. 
And uh, it was trained now, it was trained the forest, it was a decision on the forest, it was trained with one million images says here, with the depth 20 trees, 2,000 random features now per, uh, per tree, 3,000 uh, images per, uh, 300, 300,000 images per, per tree, and the distributed implementation that took a day on a thousand core uh, cluster. Okay, uh, random forests, and at that point, a real, uh, um, well, it was the time then that uh, things were starting getting exciting for the computer vision community <coughs> because you were starting to see applications in real world uh, 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 situations. Uh, and since then, things have uh, taken off quite considerably. Okay. Is that clear, the example? It was impressive in 2011, these things. We, we, we were not expecting to see this thing. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Good. So what have we said here? We were, um, uh, okay. So we have ensembles, we have boosting. Okay, good, good, good. Now, okay. Uh, what we have seen is an ensemble that was methods that were taking a weighted sum of model predictions and each of those models now, okay, were, model, were trained independently. And we created diversity now among the experts so that each one of them, they do not know anything about what the other have decided. Understandable? Yes. However, now, there is an alternative approach to it and says that, uh, which is called boosting, and it is training the experts serially, so one after the other. And the one that follows is trying to be complementary to the ones that were before uh, him or her, okay? Which means that it was trying to correct errors that they were making. And let's make it a little bit more uh, specific. This is the sketch. So we have to train now uh, different, uh, I don't know, T of those uh, uh, experts. We train the first one independently, so we train the first one, and then we make a repetition in which now we check which uh, 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 data instances the end sample that we have so far is predicting wrongly, and then we are going to train the next model such that it focuses on those that the other ones are making uh, 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 a mistake on, okay? So now the basic models are forced to be different, are forced actually to be complementary, are forced to uh, correct the mistakes that the previous models were making, okay? Uh, commonly, they are very lightweight uh, classifiers and they are need to be able to accept instance weights. Let's see that, okay? And this typically, this boosting means complex models out of many simple models. And the simple models are those decision stamps. And we're going to see exactly what we mean by that. So this is an example of the boosting in which these are the uh, examples. Now we have two attributes only. And these are the uh, uh, positive and negative examples. Okay, then we are making now a very, very, very simple now decision. Okay, in which, and the very elementary classifier, which is decision stamp, which means that we pick up a feature, and this is the feature, and we make take a threshold on that feature, which means that basically we make a threshold of this feature, which means that the decision boundary is a line, positive, negative, according to this line. Is this understandable? 100% to everybody. To whom is it not clear? Good, okay. What are the errors that I made? I classified those correctly, those correctly, those are incorrectly. So the circles here are incorrectly classified examples. Uh, so what I'm doing now is I am assigning higher weight to those examples. How do I do that? Depends, we will have to see what are the classifier, the different, it has to be on the specific classifier uh, built in it to have the capacity to, us to accept different weights for the different, uh, uh, for the different, uh, for the different uh, uh, example. And there are several classifiers that can do that, 
But in any case, let's say that the decision that we are making now is not going to try to optimize the misclassification error, but it's trying to uh, minimize the misclassification error times the uh, weight for each specific example. It's understandable. So each example have a different weight. Misclassifying an example can cost more or less depending on the weight that it has. Okay, good. And if this is the case, okay, then the decision boundary for solving this specific problem would look something like that. Why? Because, well, we cannot afford now to misclassify those examples because we are having uh, higher weights to them. And this is the decision boundary then. And then what happens then is that basically these are the ones that are misclassified, which means that I'm going to have more weight to them. And then I'm making another decision basically based on this feature here. So I set up the threshold here, which means that I'm making, I misclassify this and those two examples. And, oops. I don't know what happened. Okay. Another idea is that those classifiers, so this and this and this, are going to be combined so that they make now a complex classifier that would look like that. Okay. Um, the specific formulas that give <coughs> the weights of the different classifiers and the weights by which those example those examples, the misclassified examples are given higher weight. But we don't have time or uh, to go into that. But uh, 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 yeah, we don't have time to go into that. Okay. But you can look at it if you're interested in it. Okay. Uh, good. And these are the differences between them. The models are trained independently in the case of the bugging and randomization. In the case of boosting, they're trained sequentially and explicitly we want to have ones that are complementary. Okay. The boosting, they have typically and often they have a very good performance, even bet better than other ensemble types. But sometimes they can overfit. Okay. They can overfit. And why they can overfit? You can see the overfit is because if something is misclassified, then the weight increases, okay? If you have some, and it is okay if you can find decisions, but in, if there is something that it is, you know, very peculiar one, okay? For example, let's say that you have uh, given a wrong, by mistake, you have given maybe the wrong label to an example. Then all the effort of the classifier is going to focus on that example and is going to try again and again and again with increasing his weight to it, trying to correct the mistake that you had made. And this is an, uh, uh, how did you say that? The problematic case, what I have just described, but you can get the principle. It focuses on the wrongly classified examples, which means that it can be attracted basically more. It focuses on the errors that it, that it makes. And outliers are typically examples by which you uh, have, uh, 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 how did you say that? They will not fit very well to the model that you're making. Uh, does it make sense? And of course, we can parallelize now because one needs one to be after the other. Okay. Uh, but the good thing now with the boosting is that even if the base learner is even 51% accurate, the entire ensemble can be arbitrarily accurate on the training, of course, right? Uh, good. So up to a point, it's not longer the case, but uh, uh, boosting uh, was what has been That was another breakthrough, by the way. That was a little bit earlier than uh, the one that I have told you before. I think it was around 2004. It was a very influential pap paper by Viola and uh, Jones uh, on Ada Boost. Um, and it was one of the first real-time applications now with the, uh, 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 of uh, computer vision. 
So the idea was there, what to do would be to go and find out where faces are in an image, okay? How are we going to treat that problem? It is a classification problem, it is a regression problem. Now you have to be able to design your uh, training pipeline so that it deals with such with, with this. I'm going to tell you now how it was, how it had been uh, treated on. Uh, you were creating a classifier in which it have, as positive, it would have bounding boxes of faces, okay? Right? So images, segments in which only the face was visible, okay? And negative class were background crops, okay? Of the same size. Okay, and now a new image would come, and the idea was to detect whether there is a face and where is the face. How do we deal with that problem? The idea would be a so-called sliding window approach, in which what you do is that you go and you have a window, and you slide that window through the image. So you take that uh, uh, window here, you extract the small image out of it, you go through your classifier and the classifier tells you yes.